Well, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for this debate, which we've organised the three of us, more or less as a celebration of the end of the first semester of our master's degrees here at UOB. Uh, the three of us were fortunate enough to have been taught by today's presenters as part of our courses this semester, during which time we became aware that they seemed to differ on one topic in particular, that of economic growth in relation to environmental sustainability. So eventually, and to our surprise, we discovered that there's never been an official public debate between them, and we decided to see if we could organise today's debate as a nice way to finish all of our semesters. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> To our surprise and delight, we found that both were more than happy to donate their time here this afternoon, and we'd like to thank them very much for their generosity. We realised it was not easy to fit us in, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> Anyhow, without further ado, I'll start things off by explaining the order of proceedings. So, uh, following the introductions, which we're doing now, uh, I'll briefly intro introduce both of the speakers, uh, then they'll have ten minutes to do an opening statement each on their position. Uh, then we have three thematic questions. So each of us will be asking a question <coughs> each. Uh, and the speakers will have three minutes initially to, to, to uh, discuss their position, and then five minutes uh, rebuttal after, after that each. Uh, and we alternate who starts. So it's, it's that way. Uh, So the first question from Bilal will be about indicators and directions. Second question for me will be about application and implementation. Uh, then Leah will talk about responsibility. And then there'll be a special question after that, which is five minutes each, which will be about self-criticism. So that's when we ask them to, to discuss the, the opposite side. Uh, so, uh, I'll just, I guess most people probably know our debate is today, but I'll just run through a quick CV. Jovas Kallis works as a research professor here at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, UAB, and at the Catalan Institution of Research and Advanced Studies. He's an environmental scientist working on ecological economics and political ecology. His research focuses on the social and biophysical causes of environmental degradation. <clears throat> In particular, the political economic roots of environmental degra degradation and its uneven distribution along lines of power income and class. His current research is motivated by the double global economic ecological crisis. During today's debate, he will, defend, he will be defending the hypothesis of degrowth, which is a smooth economic downscaling to a sustainable future where we can live better with less. <coughs> and against him will be Jerome Benberg, who's also currently an ICRIA research professor at the UAB. <coughs> He's also a professor of environmental and research economics in the Faculty of Economics and Business Administration and the Institute for Environmental Studies at the VU University Amsterdam. His research focuses on the intersection of economics, environmental science, and innovation studies. In recent years, his work has focused on environmental innovation, notably renewable energy, the design of effective climate policy, assessment of climate policy impacts, carbon and energy rebound, and modeling a transition to the low carbon economy. Uh, and during today's debate, he will be defending the hypothesis of agrowth, which is being indifferent or neutral about economic growth and achieving environmental sustainability. So, we should start with uh, Jerome, and we can then he's taking an introduction. Okay, so I'll start. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being here in such large numbers. It's a pleasure. Um, let me say that I'm not so much worried about the impact of growth on the environment as I am about the preoccupation that people have, that many people have on this planet. Uh, with growth and how it affects good policy making. Maybe that sounds a little bit abstract. What I mean is that uh, we are unable as a global society to reach good environmental and climate policy simply because a lot of people are worried that it will affect negatively our economic growth in the future. They may be right. Some people have become very skeptical about certain environmental problems. Eh? solved 
their dilemma in an easy way. They deny problems. And these people are in power now in the US. Yeah? The Trump cabinet of climate skeptics. Yeah? That term has been used on the internet. For them it's easy, there is no conflict, because one problem is just denied. The big majority of the rest uh, of the people in the planet go for another strategy, that is denying that there is a dilemma, believing in green growth. But many of these people mm, don't prove their belief with their actions, because they're not voting for policies that really make a difference. And as a result, we end up with a climate agreement like one that was spoken in Paris, which is very effective. That's not an agreement on policies, it's an agreement on promises. And promises don't come true always, we know. So that's where my worry is. I'm worried that growth blocks good policy making, good international agreements. And in my view, in order to get past that, we need to make society, politicians, media aware of the fact that we shouldn't be so concerned about growth. And that's where my A-growth perspective starts to come into the picture. Uh, A-growth means, it, it was already said, it means that we are indifferent, neutral, agnostic. The A from A-growth comes from the word agnostic. I, I, I want to be agnostic, but I am also really agnostic about whether growth is, is going to be uh, combined with green or not, whether we can have a green growth in terms of solving the climate change problem. I am agnostic, agnostic about it. Uh, sometimes I'm pessimistic, sometimes I'm optimistic. If I look at all kinds of technological options, I'm optimistic. But then I see other uh, uh, things, I see trends, I see technologies that are not developing so quickly, not diffusing so quickly, and I get more pessimistic. I see the political system, I get very pessimistic. I see how humans are selfish, not interested, having other problems, showing little voluntary behavior, and I get very pessimistic. The only voluntary behavior that we need, the main voluntary behavior that we need to incite in people is that they vote for the right policies, that they vote for the right parties. That's the most important policy we need. And we haven't been successful. Look at the US. There's a lot of people in the US who voted for Trump, which is completely against their own interest. Now, that's the worst case. I mean, if people don't even know to judge their own interest in relation to political promises, yeah, that people vote for themselves, that's selfish, and not think of the rest of society, we see that a lot in politics. Some people would say that's the right-wing part of the political spectrum. That's understandable from human nature. But that people don't even know to vote in, in their own interest, yeah, well, that could also be explained by psychology, because we are boundedly rational. So, in my A-growth perspective steps away from the traditional dichotomy, opposition between pro-growth, unconditional pro-growth, and unconditional anti-growth. Uh, because it says uh, the, the measure of growth, GDP, is not a good indicator for progress or for welfare in rich countries. And as a result, we should neglect it, we should ignore it. But if you ignore something, it means you are not in favor of it growing or decreasing or being zero, no. You're neutral about it, you don't care. So for me, the step from recognizing that GDP is no longer relevant for the rich countries, I'm saying specifically the rich countries in the world, and these rich countries are important for climate change and other environmental problems, especially for climate change, because these rich countries belong to the largest emitters per capita. So these rich countries have really to contribute a great deal and they may also have to finance the poor countries to make sure that they can also reduce their emissions. So, for these rich countries, GDP is no longer relevant. And as a result, the logical step is that we should stop focusing on growth of GDP. But we should also not require that GDP should be constant, zero growth. We should not require that either. And there I come to degrowth. We should also not require that there should be some decline of uh, the economy in monetary terms. Then we, of course, can talk about physical terms. But I don't think we disagree there. Even traditional environmental economists agree that the economy should change. The dirty part should get smaller, if possible, get zero, but that's not, never possible. So there we don't have an interesting debate. 
But what I've seen is that many people talk about degrowth. They are happy if GDP doesn't grow or declines. And there we disagree. I don't think that's a guarantee for a solution to our serious problems. Um, of course, degrowth has many other keywords. I, I mentioned some of them. I associate degrowth with local activities, bottom-up processes, informal activities that don't pay taxes, non-profit activities, voluntary behavior, communism in disguise. Well, all these things are not going to solve climate change. I'm very sure about that. Voluntary action hasn't solved anything in the past except voluntary political behavior and voluntarily voting for the right policies in the right parties. But voluntary alternative lifestyles have always existed. But if you become know, big, what would us make believe now that suddenly voluntary action can become a big thing and solve the problems in the world? I'm not against it, but I don't want to believe too much in it because I don't have reasons for believing in that. Moreover, I think if I take this group of people here, they're not representative of our society. They would probably be representative of voluntary action. But I'm sure if I'm going to analyze each and every one of you, this voluntary action collapses a little bit, and you have a quite big carbon footprint that you're responsible for. Most of you travel a lot. Some of you have a good salary even, and they will spend it. And once you get a family, some of you in the future will buy a car, not all of you. But we are all in the same boat and we are all sensitive to the same crimes, environmental crimes. So I don't want to assume that you can improve your life for the better voluntarily, because I don't believe that. I want you to vote for policies that restrict you and me, each of us. I can do that. If you would ask me, sacrifice 50% of your salary for the environment, sorry, I'm not going to do it. Because I know also it's going to be contributing nothing. But if you say, vote for a policy that will tax everybody with higher salaries more and spend that money for good environmental uh, uh, purposes, I might be able to vote for that. If you say, vote for a policy of carbon pricing, you will have me on your side immediately. Because I believe that carbon pricing is really going to solve the problem. Why? Because carbon pricing will regulate each and every product and service on the planet rightly, signaling to all the decision makers, consumers, producers, investors, innovators, even the politicians, how much indirectly they're polluting by making certain decisions. And if people want it or not, they're going to change their behavior. Their budget is going to limit them because things are going to be expensive. So if you want to drive a car, fine, but you're going to fly less, or you're going to ski less, or whatever. So then the solution will come by itself. So the only thing you have to do is not voluntary action, no, is vote for the right policies. And I would like to make a bigger point of this, because I know that we can also have debates about the types of policies. And carbon pricing is often looked upon by many people as well, uh, that's an economic policy. We're not economists. We don't like economics. We don't like any of their policies. Really, don't throw the child with the bathwater away. There, there's no good alternative for carbon pricing. This is another debate, I know. But this is what, what makes me worried about the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is not going to achieve anything because either countries are not going to comply with their promises, and even if they are going to comply, they are going to try to comply with soft policies that are going to leak away to other countries, that are going to leak away to the future through uh, rebound. I don't believe in that. So, um, that doesn't mean we disagree on everything, because I think we agree on many things. That's the interesting part. We agree that GDP is not an indicator. We agree that we need strict policies, but there is a strong difference in emphasis that I think people who attach a lot of value to degrowth thinking, they believe that bottom-up spontaneous processes, voluntary action, can do a lot. And I, I think that's naive, and I like to be convinced by evidence, research, academic evidence, that that really holds some truth. <coughs> well, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to use a few slides. First of all, let me say that 
I'm going to talk about climate change and degrowth today, but the debate about degrowth is not just about climate change. So the, our main tradition here in Barcelona, starting with the work of John Martinez Allier, is to look at the effects of growth on commodity frontiers, the areas from which uh, the rich societies and the commercial centers and urban centers have been drawing the resources over and over with devastating consequences to the populations there. Economic growth started three centuries ago. The center was Britain, for example, uh, initially the Netherlands, and this happened through colonization of territories of other people, exploitation, bringing of slaves from Africa to work uh, there for nothing, and then accumulation of surpluses that went into the industry where people who were displaced from the country side ended up working. That's economic growth and that's how it continues to be today. It's ugly and, uh, and uh, should be discarded for many other reasons than the ones I'm going to present here today. But today I want to present the reasons why economic growth is a problem also in terms of climate change. And actually is the main problem. This is from a paper of Kevin Anderson, Duality in Climate Science. Kevin Anderson is the most uh, well-known uh, scientist, climate scientist engineer actually, working on mitigation strategies, who has pushed us to think in terms of a limited carbon budget, rather than how much we have to reduce carbon emissions each year. Clive Anderson, Clive Anderson says, we have 860 uh, gigatons of carbon emissions left to emit until 2100 if we want to stay within the 2 degrees Celsius, 66% sun sustained with 2 degrees Celsius of climate change, after which we know that there will be devastating consequences. This is from the IPCC. For the energy sector alone, we have 650. The remaining is emissions that are going to go from, from deforestation or from cement. This means, if we start making the calculations, and he makes them, that the annual rate of decarbonization, how much less carbon we should use each year, should be reducing 10% each year, starting by 2025. Given that poorer countries have the right to emit more carbon since they've used less of this carbon budget up to now, we, and I mean we, I mean Annex 1 countries in IPCC terms, OECD in economic terms, we have to start now reducing our carbon emissions by 13% per year. This is if we want to stay within 2 degrees Celsius and avoid devastating consequences. What are we doing up to now? At best, our, our, uh, our uh, reduction of carbon intensity up to now at the global level has been 1% per year. This, this is not a uh, similar scale as this graph, but basically the economy, since the 60s, we're not talking that far back, the global economy has grown six times. Take this number into account, six times bigger global economy, four times more carbon emissions. The two, carbon emissions and economic growth, go hand in hand. We know that. This is what has happened. People who believe in green growth will tell you that in the future this thing can change, everything changes. Someone used an example from, Car from Popper and he told me the fact that you haven't seen a black swan doesn't mean that black swans do not exist. There might be that there will be black swans in the future. Black swans in this case means emissions declining and GDP increasing. I'm saying, I'm not arguing that there are no black swans, but I'm arguing that there is enough science to tell us in what kind of lakes we're going to find white swans and in what kind of lakes we're going to find black swans. And what we know is that the causal relationship between GDP, between the output of the economy, however we happen to measure it, we measure it very wrongly, but this thing that we measure wrongly and it's called GDP, correlates very strongly with carbon emissions. That's a diagnosis. That's, I'm not saying what we should do. I'm saying how things are. And things are in this way. 1% increase in GDP leads to 0.6 to 0.7% increase in carbon emissions. If we want to reduce carbon emissions 13% per year, it seems almost impossible to me to imagine how we can start reducing carbon emissions 13% per year without also reducing the scale of the economy. I'll go back to that because I think there is a big misunderstanding of uh, what the degrowth argument is here and I'll make it in a, in a moment. Let me argue also that this is not just an accidental historical relationship that is going to change easily in the future. We have a whole body of work which started also here in Barcelona among other places which is called ecological economics and explains theoretically why carbon emissions and the output of the economy measured by GDP are so tightly linked. In ecological economics, we are saying that the economic process is not some 
magic process of human capital or uh, capital or technology is a very specific process of extracting, processing and transforming energy and resources which are then embodied into product and services. Services too that might seem low carbon have a lot of carbon content no? because there is a lot, a whole economy uh, below them that supports them. Uh, what we also claim in ecological economics, and that's a very important claim to keep in mind, is we're saying what moves the economy is work. It's work by humans, by our muscles and by our brains, but also work done by horses initially and fossil fuels later. later. Horsepower is what moves our machine, what moves our lights, what moves our cars. This is what moves the economy. And this is confirmed by the data that up to now shows a very tight link between the scale of the economy and its energy use in terms of fossil fuels and in terms of carbon emissions. So this tight link is not accidental, okay? That's our diagnosis. What's the prognosis? Which means the proposal. I think your own here confuses what's the deep growth argument and misrepresents it, but it's not his fault. I mean, we've decided, we've discussed it many times and I haven't managed to convince him otherwise, which means I don't express it very well. And I agree, this is a self-criticism starting too early, that we evolve as we go, and I think now the argument is a little bit clearer. So we are not arguing that we should target the economy and we should try to make it reduce its GDP 1 or 2 percent each year. That's not the degrowth argument, please. I want, I want to make this very clear. We're not talking about targeting negative GDP growth. No one has ever said that. What we are saying is, we start from the point, yes, we need to reduce carbon emissions dramatically, right? We all agree on that. We know that less carbon emissions means a smaller economy that uses less carbon per unit, uh, less carbon per unit of product. Jeroen accepts as much in his own articles. He explains why is it very difficult just by the just by developing better technologies and reducing carbon unit per product, which is the carbon efficiency, why it's usually very difficult to reduce carbon emissions. He says that maybe you put solar panels, but solar panels are fueled right now by fossil fuels. Maybe you develop renewable energy technologies, very nice, but these technologies take less, uh, have less net energy out than fossil fuels. In fossil fuels, you put one energy down to take oil out of the ground, and you have 100 units of energy. With solar panels, you put one unit of energy to construct, and you take 10 out, much less. So it's difficult to support a big economy, and you don't accept all these arguments. Also, labor productivity, the source of growth, is going to be reduced probably if you start investing more and more in renewable technologies. Again, that's an argument that Jeroen makes very forcibly in his work. If that's the case, then this means that it's impossible, impossible, I repeat, impossible, to reduce carbon emissions in an economy that is not smaller than the current one. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't go the renewable way. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't become more efficient in the way we use carbon, etc. It means we should do both. And it means that inevitably we, we will do both. Now, we know though that a smaller economy under capitalism tends to be catastrophic. So recessions are awful periods, OK? So what is the question, or what's the hypothesis? Is can and how? The hypothesis is that yes, we can. But Obama proved that no, we can't. But let's say, yes, we can create a low carbon, low output economy that provides well-being. That's the degrowth hypothesis. And then the degrowth research agenda is, how do we do that then? Because if we don't do that, the other way that the economy is going to adjust is through disaster. We're going to have less output and less carbon emissions after a huge collapse in the next 50 years. So why not a growth? Why I'm not in favor of a growth? First of all, because I believe in the diagnosis I just provided. So if I think that there is a gravity law, I will not try to build a bridge that goes against the gravity law. I believe that this is almost a law. Of course, you can debate whether it's, there is so much sense, certainty in what I argued as, as a law of physics. But I think it's quite strong evidence, theoretically, back that there is an inherent relationship between the economy and carbon emissions. Second, if you are agnostic, you cannot change entrenched ideas and institutions. If you don't believe that evolution is right, you will not take it out of the curriculum. And agnosticism, I think, is a weak basis for the precautionary principle. If we don't know if growth is possible or is not possible, why should we be precautionary and avoid growth rather than be precautionary and have growth? Because we know that growth also has some good benefits, or at least people are arguing this way. But why would I say also yes to a growth? Or another term that's used at post-growth, and I like it a little bit more because it shows that we have to go beyond growth, not just ignore it. 
Because I agree with Jeroen that this is a complex issue. So I have respect for scientists like Jeroen who believe that we cannot still call it and say that it's one way or the other, although I disagree on that. I agree with him that we should ignore GDP, but I think it's much more difficult to ignore GDP than what he claims. I think GDP is an entrenched part of our society because our societies, our capitalist societies, are designed in order to, to grow or collapse. That's why we are measuring GDP. Unless we change this society, we will not change the indicator that measures it. I agree with him on many of the policies, but I disagree, I disagree on the politics. And I think the importance of voluntary activities is not on their precise reduction of carbon, uh, uh, of carbon emissions, but precisely because they create the ambient and the society and the culture for a different politics. People will not vote to reduce their own emissions unless they already believe in a different life that will be better using less emissions. Otherwise, you would vote for Trump because you want to keep flying. <laughs> In certain political contexts, I'm willing to use the term growth. I think it's a term that might allow you to build broader political alliances that are really important right now. For example, if I was to participate in the Barcelona government right now, which is a radical government, I wouldn't go there crazy, pushing like we should put the growth every in every single sentence that we use. I would be, though, pushing for avoiding to put any emphasis on the economic growth, on GDP, etc. And on this I agree with you. And I think it's a very important first step to stop talking about economic growth and stop talking about GDP. But I think it's far from enough. As I'm seeing, the debaters went pretty far uh, for their first uh, allocution. Uh, so I just want to precise that we have two hours in front of us. So just, uh, I think we have enough time to address all the issues. Just uh, keep an eye on the, on the time for your teams. So, so just to start this debate, uh, our, our first topic will, will address um, some fundamental assumption behind agrowth or degrowth. And so it will go like that. Uh, in Turn on the light there too to see the people, otherwise it's a little bit <laughs> scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jeroen and Jorgos, in your, in your articles, when you address ecological transition, it is often accompanied by a shift in valuation or in methods of valuation. So, uh, for example, a shift from GDP to welfare or an opposition between exchange value and use value. So, uh, to start this, this debate, um, can you pre present what do we integrate in this conception or in your conception of well-being and how do we measure and consider them in the context of an ecological transition? I would say that we don't need to re uh, replace GDP with a single indicator that tries to measure everything. There's not a single indicator of well-being. I think we need information as we need information about everything in our life. So when you go and you do a medical exam, you know, you get many different uh, results about your, your health condition. You don't get a single indicator that says, okay, you're very well or you're not very well or you got 1% better this year. No? You get the multiple information and you judge depending on context of what of this information is uh, relevant and what is not relevant, right? So I think we need information on the context that we are speaking here, carbon emissions and uh, the level of accumulated carbon emissions in the atmosphere is a key indicator for many things that should become a limiting indicator. A resource throughputs, there are other indicators to measure our damage on the environment. And of course, there are many other ways which we can measure how well we are doing socially. But uh, these indicators are not necessarily objective. It doesn't mean life expectancy is, for example, one, but it doesn't mean we should all live 150 years. There are reasonable expectations about what a reasonable life expectancy is. There are reasonable expectations of what health standards we should have, what services we should get from the state and at what cost. And I think we should be measuring all these things uh, and, and the distribution of income and wealth. We should be measuring all these things as part of how well we are doing as a society. Well, I agree with George. <coughs> don't need necessarily one indicator. On the other hand, I am sympathetic to indicators like the Index of Sustainable Economic Welfare or the, the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is a derivation of it, as developed by Herman Daly and, and Associates. 
But to calculate that indicator for each country frequently is extremely difficult, we know, because all the calculations that we have right now are different, because they use different data. Um, what I think is, is more important is that um, we educate people about how to use information. For instance, the GDP information is, is so important because people are at a young age indoctrinated by media, by education, that GDP growth is good, that it's standard of well-being, standard of living. Um, if you study economics, I know from my experience, well, I didn't study actually economics, but I, I, I never came across any criticism of the GDP indicator as a measure of progress or welfare, and I think things haven't improved probably in most economics faculties around the world. Um, so if young people don't hear about that, yeah, then they're indoctrinated at a certain point, and it's very difficult to move away. Same for the media. Many journalists will change between growth and progress and standard of living and GDP as if these things are, are synonyms. And we should fight for that. So that's one of the concrete things that a growth can propose. A growth is not a big utopian ideological idea, no, but it gives you clues for what to do. We should put also convince, for instance, people from developing countries and their political leaders that an a growth position could work to their benefit because if in the rich countries we become more relaxed about growth, not against growth, not in favor of zero growth necessarily, but relaxed about growth and not worried if growth is not so high, that means for them more opportunities to grow. And it is very difficult for them to improve a lot of things in their lives without growing in economic terms, uh, I think. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I want to add the point that the point of measuring GDP is not like a scientific mistake or a policy mistake. There is a reason for that and we have to understand why we are measuring GDP and why GDP is such an important indicator of our capitalist societies and of our times. So this is, this is important to understand and otherwise I think we, you know, we are fetishizing something that we think we can just attack and change it while there is a whole monster behind it and that's just one, one part of this thing. So uh, the, GDP, the, the GDP indicator is made measuring the scale of the economy because the scale of the economy matters for the type of society we live in. So we cannot ignore that when GDP falls and declines in the type of societies we are having right now, there are all sorts of problems. That's point one. Second, GDP measures in general the possibility for profits, which is what drives capitalist uh, companies and capitalist entrepreneurs to invest. So if you know that GDP is growing, it's a time to invest. If it's going down, it's not a time to invest. Of course, we can measure these things also differently. That's not the point. But the point is that if we focus just on the metric, we are losing why, we are losing the point of why is this metric there and why is it so important. It's not just a matter that if we stop, if we start ignoring GDP and we don't measure it, and then the economy declines in terms of GDP that we don't lo no longer measure, that everything is going to be fine. No, everything is not going to be fine. Imagine if we were in Greece, where we had what we had these years, and we didn't measure GDP. Still, it would be a disaster. It's not just a matter that we were measuring GDP that made it a disaster. Let, let me add one more thing on how to use indicators. Georgios made a use of indicators that in my uh, reasoning is not correct. So he said GDP and environmental indicators, CO2 emissions, they're very correlated and therefore we have to expect in the future it will be very difficult to, to decouple them. Well, that's a, again an issue of black and white swans. We have never tested whether good environmental policy and good climate policies are able to delink uh, the two. And I'm not particularly positive about it, but I must admit that if we, for instance, are capable of going to renewable energy very quickly, then, then we have solved a lot of our problems. So I wouldn't want to assume that the trend of correlation between two indicators, as in the past, will continue. No. That there can be trend breaks, but they require extremely ambitious policies, and we haven't tried out these policies. So that is for me a reason to not support you in your claim that solving the problem of CO2 will mean a smaller economy. And along with that, I think you're also not exactly accurate with your interpretations about decline, economic decline or negative growth, because if you say that the economy has to get smaller uh, then you are effectively saying that we need negative GDP growth. Maybe not a constant rate per, per year, but 
uh, there may be periods of significant decline. Oh, I'm saying that. Uh, well, but, but you're also... I'm saying that's not the target. But, but, you, but you're I'm often saying. denying that, that uh, degrowth has a, a strong relationship with negative growth or GDP decline. I don't think you can deny that, that, that relation is... It's a diagnosis, but not uh, the but, target. But for me, exactly, the reason to worry about is that it sounds to me as dogmatic as the pro-growth, as the unconditional pro-growth perspective. Why would I want to be dogmatic? And also, you criticize the term agnostic. Come on, you cannot say that an agnostic view cannot lead to clear insights or clear policies. That's a bit wordplay, I think. I mean, uh, with agnostic, I could easily say I'm an atheist. With regard to, if you like that term better, the difference between atheist and agnosticism is a matter of probabilities only. So if you want, I'm, I'm also an atheist, I'm not an atheist, I'm an atheist. Well, that sounds to many people like this guy wants to change the world. Yeah, or not. Oh, I want to change the world with an agnostic perspective, and I think I can do it. Uh, ju just, just to be clear, for each topic, there's one statement for each and then one answer for each. I know that each topic can go really far, but just to be able to, to keep an eye on all our topics, we will just keep to the same, and if you see some connection, uh, go for yeah, it. Yeah, okay, no yeah. So, our next question is, uh, it's, it's along the lines of application and implementation. Now, um, a lot of the theorizing on, and the articles written about degrowth and agrowth, uh, we, I've noticed, uh, from a very sort of global north perspective, in that they focus on, on what we can do to change our energy consumption or our lifestyle choices uh, as people in the first world who probably undoubtedly use way too much energy. Um, so my question is, how do you propose to incorporate the pre-existing inequities between the global north and south into your uh, approaches? It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> it's true that, uh, of course, I propose that one reason why uh, Paris wasn't the success we wanted it to be was that people are afraid that green growth is not possible uh, and therefore they didn't want to impose too strict policies. But another reason is, of course, that there is a lot of inequality in the world and uh, the developing countries uh, have their own agenda, want uh, the rich countries to take the lead, to take the majority part of emissions reduction. For that reason, among others, uh, also plans uh, have been designed to compensate uh, the poor countries by funds from the rich countries. Um, well, I already said something in that respect. I think, for instance, that carbon pricing, whether you do it with taxes or with trade or current systems or combinations of those in, in the world, there are experiments being done with both, they could generate revenues that could be used for redistribution, both in countries to make sure that uh, energy poverty would be minimized, but also, of course, between countries. Uh, any other instrument would have difficulty uh, generating revenue, so would not generate revenue. So that makes me also skeptical about other instruments, and other instruments will also have distributional effects. If you, with standards, make um, companies reduce emissions strongly, it also will have the result that prices of associated products will go up and there will be energy poverty or, or poverty in other terms that has to be uh, addressed by policy, but there are no revenues there. That's interesting because many people raise as an objection against carbon pricing this distributional issue. Carbon pricing means inequity, but I see it rather differently. I think that carbon pricing is basically the only instrument that can generate revenues to create complementary policies that can solve the inequity issues. I'm not saying this is easy, nothing is easy, of course. You can kill any proposal for a solution, but it's not easy, of course. But I, I personally think that this is probably the best way to go forward. The only problem is that many people don't see it like that, to, to educate people about it. And in fact, I have a paper on this where we had a lot of debate with the, 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 the reviewers who were coming from social sciences who didn't like carbon pricing and at the end we managed to, to convince our reviewers that there is a lot of value in carbon pricing. So that paper is ex exactly meant to convince the non-believers about the importance and the inevitability of carbon pricing. I would go so far as to say if we don't manage to implement carbon pricing worldwide, seriously, we can forget about solving 
climate change, really. And I've given this a lot of thought, so I'm open to a debate on this, but I don't see any other instrument that can do that job. Because it's such, as George has illustrated, that I completely agree. We are filling the carbon budget that we have up to two degrees very quickly. We, we know the graphs that say how much time we have left. Eh? With some probabilities, we have six years left in the worst case scenario. And then we have to go at the maximum of redu reducing uh, <laughs> negatively the, up to that. So I, I am pessimistic and, and we need to come up with very tight, effective solutions that are well thought through. On the north-south question, I would say that the framing of a carbon, carbon budget uh, helps us see that if we, if we consider that there's a limited carbon budget, then there are people who have used more of this and people who have used less of that. So in one sense, those countries, those and those people within these countries that have used more of this uh, carbon budget have a carbon debt to those who have used less. How this debt can be repaid, we can discuss it. It can be repaid by financial transfers, it can be repaid by qualitative transfers, it can be repaid by using much less of the remaining carbon budget than these other people or these other countries. And this was a little bit the approach uh, I followed there. So we have to think of a total carbon budget rather than allocating the existing uh, emissions. Mm -hmm. Up to now, and despite all the agreements, the Kyoto, the Rio, the Rio's plus 20, the Rio's plus I don't know how many years, and uh, Paris, no money and very little money and very little support has flowed from the north to the south. That, this is to show how difficult this uh, simple point is. Another point to show is that we did an economic experiment, the only economic experiment I've done, a public good game with a friend a few years ago that was published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we simulated the climate change agreement. And what we found was that if you give people different amounts of money, the only way for them to cooperate is if you redistribute from those who have more money to those uh, who have less money. If you don't redistribute, the game ends up most of the time into a disaster. And this is a thing we're heading now, because rich people and rich countries, but especially rich people, are not willing to redistribute without a catastrophe. And that's the main problem. About carbon pricing, I agree with Jeroen. I'm against carbon trading because I think it creates fictitious markets for corporations to profit and much, uh, nothing more than that. But I'm in favor of carbon taxes, and especially carbon taxes that they are uh, designed in a way that redistributes. Carbon taxes that take money uh, from people, from carbon taxes, and gives them back to the people who most need them, for example, by reducing the, the income taxes for the poorest people in our societies, or for the poorest people around the world, uh, through financial transfers. So I really believe that the carbon tax is a must-must of a transition. I'm much less optimistic than Jeroen that this reasonable proposal, which has been on the table for decades now, can suddenly be politically implemented, given the lack of a uh, political momentum uh, right now behind this type of proposals. Well, can I add one thing about it? That the carbon price to be negotiated in the international climate agreement makes these negotiations much easier than they have been up to now. The result of the Paris Agreement is effectively not a negotiated result. It's just, okay, we cannot come to an agreement. Everybody gives its own promise, its own pledge. And these pledges are not consistent. With one of my PhD Louis King, we are looking at that. Uh, and it turns out that they go very broad, in a very broad spect spectrum. And they haven't been compared. It's also difficult to compare because they've been put in very different terms. So um, I, I think that, uh, well, that we have to realize that. You have something to add? Yeah, just one. I wasn't so aware of the details of the Paris Agreement and intricacies, but I was in a workshop lately that I heard much more about that. And just for those of us who haven't looked so closely to the Paris Agreement, the key point to, to remember is that the idea that we can somehow reduce emissions to a sustainable level by 2050 or 2100 fundamentally rests on huge assumptions that they are hidden behind the text of net negative emissions, technologies of net negative emissions after 2050. So the whole Paris Agreement, which was so difficult to, to reach, and it's so difficult to achieve, actually, because already the pledges go beyond what 
countries committed to, okay? This is already difficult and rests on an unfounded assumption that somehow we will have magic technologies by 2050 that will start sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, okay? This is just to see how, how deep of a hole we are right now, okay? Like, take out the negative carbon emissions, which I took them out, and then the rates of decarbonization are 13% per year starting tomorrow. When we are talking about rates of decarbonization, in the best case scenarios of 3%. Rates of decarbonization of more than 4% have not been observed in an economy that was growing uh, in terms of GDP. That's a little bit to give a sense of the challenge. But, but it's good to add, I agree completely with that, but it's good to add that these, these rates of reduction were never steered by serious policies. And we don't know what policies can do. And I'm quite optimistic because I have to add that that's also in all my writings on this topic, I have to write always a paragraph to say that I am optimistic about that the economy in principle has a tremendous flexibility to change. But we have to make use of that change. The economy can change in so many ways. The consumption structure can change tremendously. The, the transport can change tremendously. The inputs to production, including energy materials, can change tremendously. How people get happy. Uh, research and development, everything can change, but we have to put pressure on it, it won't change by itself. That's why I don't believe in voluntary change. You have to guide the system. Take an example, the car industry. All the car mobile manufacturers are now experimenting with hybrid and electric cars, but they're not making it big, because uh, oil is cheap, gasoline is cheap, so it's not a good moment. If you would put a carbon price, make sure that the equivalent of a ton of oil would never be cheaper than $100, things would change. If you would make sure that for, for the distant future that price would never come below that and even would go up with a rising carbon price, well, see how quickly the car industry is going to offer cheap and reliable hybrid and electric cars and how quickly the networks to support those of, of gasoline stations with electricity, fuel, uh, parts will, will develop. But now, of course, that's a different situation. Now it's voluntary. It's voluntary on the side of the consumers and voluntary on the side of the producers. And that, that's going too slow. Yeah, okay, thank you for this. It's, all, it's, um, it's a very good um, transition to the next question we have, which is um, about, well, your approaches um, propose very different mechanisms for implementing uh, the transitions and they are partly based on bounded rationality or on voluntary action, which you, both of you already mentioned. And um, we would like to know um, who you think should assume the responsibility for implementing actions required to realize your approaches and why? why? Uh, I think that change will either be political or it won't be at all, you know. We see that unless, and I think this, in this I agreed with you, Ron, but I think has also changed over the years, and that's good because we are all evolving, we are not stagnating here at ICTA. <laughs> so his position was changed because the most important thing is to vote, so he put the primacy on politics, which for a political ecologist is what we are trying to teach in the class, so yes, the, the key level of change is politics, but what I think is not just a matter of voting, it's not just a matter of once per year voting for Clinton, who is green growth at best, versus Trump, who is black growth at best. It might be even black growth at best. Okay? So that's not the choice we're having. The choice we're having is whether to create some social change that will create also general, different politics, create different uh, representatives, different uh, different states with different policies doing some of the things we are arguing and not just doing progressive social justice things that it's already very difficult to happen within the current climate but we are talking about progressive social justice in a context of using less and less resources there is no political force right now representing that other than a few people and activists talking about the growth or eco-socialism that these are the only people who are putting this in the agenda and I think unless this political transformation is put in the agenda and there are people representing it and there are people being elected and there are people en enacting these changes, it won't happen. In this sense, I feel it's very important to put emphasis on these alternative economic practices that you don't kind of snob because they don't necessarily reduce the low carbon or because the people who are involved take the airplane, okay? 
The point is not whether the people are taking the airplane. The, the, the point is that whether there are people creating and constructing alternative economies that might work in the future and inspire us and get people involved in a different type of politics. The Indignado movement and the Occupy movement was one type of hope of this kind. And this movement grew together with this type of alternative projects. No, these alternative projects did not reduce carbon emissions, but that's not the point of these alternative projects, to reduce carbon emissions. The point is to show that there is an alternative and create a political force that can argue for this alternative. Otherwise, who will come to argue there on their own that they have to be taxed in order to not take the airplane? There is no social force to ask for this thing unless we create this social force. Well, on that, uh, I agree completely that the bottom-up has, has to be first. So the bottom-up is political. People have, have to vote for the right party, have, be, have to become active maybe even in politics. And for that, the information is important. And one positive thing is that information about climate change, the most important and clear this threat, I think, in, in the global environmental area, well, that information is increasing. And I must say that I always notice, if I give lectures, and there's a lot of elderly people, then I always have questions after, afterwards, well, now not so much anymore, but maybe eight years ago, ten years ago, do you really believe in climate change? Do you really think it is true? Because you have to accept that if you lived a long life, you never heard about climate change, and suddenly information pops up here and there, there's climate change maybe, and other people say, no, it's not true. Well, you're not immediately switching over to, oh, there's climate change. For young people, it's different. If you, at a young age, during school already, hear automatically climate change, climate change, you're not going to resist. It's like if you tell the Christmas, uh, uh, Santa Claus exists. People believe that, if it's true or not. But if you tell a child a lie or a truth, they believe it, you know? So, uh, if climate change is a truth, and it's told at a young age, that is the most important trend we can hope for that will make a difference. But I, it's probably not going fast enough. Uh, but let me say a, a few other things. For instance, we have Trump. Trump is terrible. There's no doubt about it. It's like we are all in a mafia movie, in a bad <laughs> mafia movie, really. But we also have to admit that Obama probably could only emerge after two Bushes. Without Bushes, there wouldn't have been a, an Obama. Probably the US wouldn't have been ready for Obama without the Bushes. So after Trump, America is ready for a lot. <laughs> I would say. So that's also hopeful, but uh, it takes some time. Although some people say uh, it can happen quickly in impeachment. But Richard Dawkins said, there's a not funny, Richard Dawkins is funny to follow nowadays, because he makes, he makes the funniest statements about, uh, about Trump. So he said, for instance, and this ignorant fool is one impeachment away from the presidency. And of course, that was the vice president who made very negative statements about evolution. Um, well, I should also say that, so I believe very much in that there is a bottom-up process needed and that voters have to become aware. So the most important voluntary action, I, I want to repeat that, is that people vote for the right parties. Because I would like to know, for instance, all the people that protested against Trump on the inauguration day, how many of them didn't vote? And there are, for sure, there's always a percentage. It's not zero. That's, that's impossible. So there's going to be a percentage of 20, perhaps, of those people who didn't vote. And that is a pity. That's a pity. And we have to reach those people. I feel it also as my obligation as a scientist to reach out to a wider audience. I try to also reach a wider audience with the message that climate change is really more complicated. And then, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this gets to let, let me say three more things about. But you will have a second Sorry. So there are two things there. First of all, about, about our change, we have to realize how difficult is our change. First and foremost, so our change is not so easy as getting informed about climate change. We are very informed about climate change, but as Jeroen rightly pointed. It's very hard for us to change uh, our lifestyles. So my partner is from California and her family lives there. For us, not to fly becomes very difficult. I'm not saying this to justify the flying, but I'm saying to see how difficult in a life that has been structured on fossil fuels is then to not use fossil fuels and to go away from them, even if you know what's the consequences of that in the next 40 years. 
it's about your whole life. It's not about being someone irresponsible or a Trump supporter who says it doesn't exist. It's you realize it that you're born, but you cannot change. This is why this change is very difficult, and this is why this change can only start if we really change at the grassroots level and at the level of the everyday creating new structures. I don't know what new structures, but new structures that are not necessarily dependent on this uh, model that they depend now. On the second, about politics, I would say yes, Obama came out after Bush, but Obama, fortunately, was the best we could hope, and he was disappointingly little what he managed to do in terms of climate change, to take just one example of mm -hmm. many other things that he failed. He wrote a paper that was published in Science uh, upon his departure that we haven't managed to do yet. So <laughs> that was his major achievement in terms of climate change, the publication in the Science. But other than that, very little. And this was the best. I mean, it's a likable guy, someone you think, okay, more or less he thinks like me, maybe he could be more radical. And that's how, how far he went. So what do we really hope? That after after Trump in the US, there will be eight years of someone like Hillary Clinton and then eight years of someone worse than Trump, because it goes like that, the Democrats are always moderate, etc. And this is just the US, because then we can see also what's happening politically in Europe, and it's even more terrifying, or even the same terrifying, okay? So we have all these changes that right now, they don't look good. So I don't think it's just a matter of vote for the right person every four years. It needs much more work than that. These are your last five minutes for okay. this topic. Okay. Well, I, I want to bring an agnostic <coughs> again. Okay. In the US, you cannot say you're an agnostic or, or an atheist. Then the path to presidency is lost, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also, and that, that's regardless whether it's about religion or growth. You cannot say I'm an agnostic about religion and an agnostic about uh, uh, growth. But to defend Obama, because he, he claimed he's He's religious. To, to defend Obama, he didn't have uh, the parliaments, uh, the Congress with him, and that's been the problem. Also, Clinton had the problem. The Republicans seem to be able always to have a president and a Congress in the same direction, but the, the Democrats not. So, because I personally think that anything that I've seen written or said by Obama was completely correct. If he would have had the power, he would have done more, but he didn't have the power. Mm -hmm. But I think there are other levels that are important because I also believe that politics is not just bottom-up, there is an endogenous, or, or I should call it maybe an exogenous, an independent dynamics of politics too. For instance, politics has the power to move as a whole to the left. You see that the, in the Nordic countries, all the, the political parties are generally a little bit more progressive. Um, and and yeah, that, that means that whatever party you vote for, yeah, that party will be in favor of renewable energy, to, to put it a bit simply, simplistic. Um, so <laughs> we should also benefit from the fact that this exogenous dynamics has, exists and try to influence it. And even at the international level, there are institutions that have their own dynamics, like the OECD, the World Bank, um, and the IMF. They deal with environmental issues. They are enlightened, but they are always talking about Think things like beyond growth and in, 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 how do you call that inclusive growth doesn't help me very much. Um, I, I have given once a lecture on a growth at the OECD with all the ambassadors of all the different countries of the OECD, and to my surprise, they liked it, and that gives me some hope. They said that they were really people who had quite some experience in, in institutions at the national, international level, and they said that a growth was a refined idea that could. Uh, expect a lot of support. Uh, yeah, that brings me back to, to degrowth. I fear that if we talk about degrowth, we just polarize. And then you get the fight between pro and degrowth. And I want to step away from that. And I think not just to step away for it for the, for the sake of it, but uh, because I really think it's logical. I don't want to choose between pro and, and anti-growth. I am neutral. Sometimes we will have growth, sometimes not. I don't care. I really don't care. But I know that a lot of people care. And I cannot change these people to degrowth. I don't want them either, but that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is that you're just going to create a divide. And that's not going to solve it. I think we have to make use of the fact that a lot of people who believe in degrowth believe also in agrowth. And a lot of people who say green growth have said now already, because I did questionnaires and I have talked, spoke to a lot of people, yeah, I'm also agrowth a little bit. I, I admit I'm agrowth. They haven't given it thought before. But if they really understand it, 
Some people will say also, oh, A growth is in between, so it's zero growth. No, it's not zero growth. Because it's not dogmatic, it's nothing. It's neutral about growth, being neutral about growth. It's difficult, it has to sink in. If you haven't heard of it before, give it some time. Don't say immediately yes or no. Give it some time. <laughs> We have one more now or no? One question. Yeah. No, but I don't have a second opportunity. Oh, I think I was very second. Oh, you saw it. That's your first. Huh? It's my third now. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Wrong. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So. Um, Last question we have is, um, as you already, as you um, criticized each other and defended your own position, so we would be very interested in, um, yeah, how, where do you see, or what do you see um, as the main challenge in your own, own approach, or well as criticism, for us to learn from your expertise about your own position? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely accept the point that we cannot logically prove that the green growth or some kind of decoupling is impossible. So, logically, you cannot prove that, okay? And I understand that this is a weak point to the extent that everyone can mobilize that and tell you, you know what, I can imagine the possibility, and that's what uh, Jerome is saying, of a black swan in the future, no? I can imagine that somehow the capitalist economy stops expanding, stops using more and more resources, doesn't care about GDP, and just innovates in terms of ideas and does things more and more efficiently, and this increases the output of the economy and at the same time reduces resource use. So yes, logically or theoretically I cannot disprove it. What I can do to the best of my knowledge, and I think science always works to the best of our knowledge, is to see at the date of what has happened in 300 years of capitalism, what is happening among countries today, and link that to a theoretical model that is coming out of ecological economics and has certain concepts and ideas, and saying that these two make me think that this transition, for whatever reasons, might be political, might be because of Trump, might be because of this or that, seems to be a very tight connection. What is it that connects these two factors who might search it longer, but what we know is from ecological economics a set of hypotheses why these two factors are so strongly connected and so difficult to disconnect. But I, re I realize that my weakness is that logically I cannot prove that uh, this is impossible. Again, the point of the growth is not that we should reduce the GDP, is that having made this diagnosis that if we are to have a cleaner economy, a fairer economy, a more just economy, it's going to be also a smaller economy, how do we make this possible? So it's not going for the smaller economy, it's realizing that that's inevitable and thinking how do we make this be maintain uh, well-being at the same time? How do we make this fair? Well, uh, I think my idea is good, so I don't see weakness. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry for that. No, I was thinking, is there a weakness? Well, I just take it up and first. Also, <laughs> and the proof of the plotting is also that Giorgio agrees with it. So, this is actually great. What can I say? But, but, of course, I can say one, one thing that, that I've been thinking of lately is the name. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion if degrowth was a good name, D is negative, people don't like it, psychologically it was not a good choice. A growth, I'm not sure either, but yeah, growth has to be there. Eh? The word growth has to be there, so you have to put something in front of it or, or after it. 